Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Peter. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. How are you? Good to see you. Alhamdulillah, doing great. Yeah, doing great. Really nice to chat again. <laughs> Peter, I'm really happy to, to have you on my podcast. Um, again, this podcast, Muslim Makers, is usually um, in French. Uh, I usually record um, French uh, professionals and people in France to, to share their their journey um, and what they do and so that they can give us some of their experience. Um, but today uh, I'm starting a short series uh, of people from all around the world, especially in Western countries, but, but in other countries as well. And the idea, again, I explained to that in the other, the, the first recording, the first interview I did last week, but it's not out yet. <laughs> it's going to be out inshallah, in a couple of days from now. Uh, the idea is to share to the, the primary idea is to share to the French audience what's happening around the world, give them some other perspective of how Muslims are organized around the world, what they do, what's happening. Because uh, you're, you're probably not aware, but France is very limited by the language barrier. barrier. Um, and uh, a lot of what's happening around the world doesn't get to, to, to France, to the Muslim, French Muslims. So... Mm -hmm. Very happy to have you again. Um, what time is it right now for you? There is a lot of time difference. Yeah, so so yeah, it's kind of late afternoon. Um, mm -hmm. And usually Australia, because of this, the way the time zones are set up is is kind of ahead. <laughs> so the the joke is usually that um, you know the future is future is safe because it's always tomorrow in Australia <laughs> for most <laughs> people. So yeah, it's a Wednesday afternoon and uh, probably early maybe Wednesday for you or late Tuesday depending on where you are. It's uh, early Wednesday, almost 9 a.m. <laughs> That's good. great, great. So, Inshallah. Peter, to start, um, would you like to make a short introduction of who you are, uh, where do you come from, what do you do, real quickly? Yeah, I'd be very happy to. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. Uh, well, firstly, thanks so much for having me. Really great to connect with you, and I really enjoyed our last meeting so it's wonderful to be on your podcast and connect with everyone listening thank you for taking the time i'm very grateful to uh to be with your host here and uh it's you know looking forward to our conversation so yes alhamdulillah my name is peter uh also have the muslim name yasin uh but i usually use you know peter day today as that's been you know sort of my convention for um since when i became muslim which was about 20 years ago so i was 20 at that time now i'm 41 uh, a few more gray hairs uh, a few more children <laughs> and uh, definitely you know lots of things i've learned and uh, alhamdulillah it's been quite a journey so um what i usually am based in sydney australia uh but i have lived in uh, dubai for a little while and san francisco in california um, day to day, I guess you could say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty busy hands-on father, uh, you know, and I, you know, very grateful where I live, you know, that, you know, being close to my, my family and our community here in, in Sydney. Um, but a lot of my time, of course, goes into, um, building, uh, creative projects, design studio related projects. So I've run a design consulting firm for over 20 years now, actually, since I, before I was Muslim. And uh, in that time, I've uh, been able to do lots of different kinds of creative projects around the world. Mm -hmm. um, before I became interested in Islam, I knew too much about it. Um, I was a graphic designer in the early days of the kind of dot-com, early internet sort of era, I guess you'd call it, building websites, things like that, you know, 20 years ago. And then over the last, you know, really 10, 15 years, more and more my professional journey uh, in design and creative practice has uh, being more directly aligned, uh, inshallah, with my spiritual path and aspirations to, uh, you know, really understand and apply Islamic concepts to directly to uh, to design and creative work. Uh, and I've also worked on a few different products, um, the client projects, of course, but also a range of products. Um, some of which have, I believe, sold very well in France. Actually, I found out. So, so that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we might talk to it a bit uh, a bit later again. Uh, thank you, uh, yeah. Peter. Um, I think um, a, a, a lot of French people are fascinated about Australia. Many people want to go there for, for vacation or for working holidays or for whatever. Uh, but it's often a, a challenge because it's so far. <laughs> it's such mm -hmm. a long journey yeah. to, to come to, to Australia. 
um, uh, my audience might wonder what's the situation of Muslims in in Australia? Is it a big population? How 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 are there? Uh, do you have messages? Do you have Muslims? <laughs> but, <laughs> yep. Can you talk to us about the, the situation of Muslims there? Absolutely. All questions welcome. And inshallah, you're all welcome. Anyone listening, I do hope you're able to join us here. We are quite far away from Europe um, and from a lot of places, unless you're maybe in, in Asia somewhere. Um, so I appreciate that, you know, sometimes we are, we do feel like a distant planet even or, uh, you know, a bit of a, you know, imaginary place, but it is a real country. Um, <laughs> there are people that we live here, um, the love for, um, in fact, um, Australia has a very fascinating history. It has a very, very deep and rich tradition with an indigenous Australian population. Uh, and it's an incredible conversation we can have around that. What is also fascinating in this context is the Australian uh, indigenous connection to Islam, which I didn't actually know about or learn about until I was Muslim and then exploring uh, this this topic with uh, with certain projects and, and organizations and a museum, actually. Um, I'll share a little bit about that because I think I've found it quite fascinating. Oh, and to be honest, not too many people know about it. So a kind of brief version, if you like, is... Um, um, quite some time before European settlement. So, you know, the, the British came here. We were kind of British colony. Um, you know, the Europeans came in the late 18th century. But at least 100 years before that, maybe more, maybe several hundred years, we're not too sure, um, there were traders from our northern neighbor, which is kind of present-day Indonesia or Malaysia. Um, oh. Previously, you might have called it Malaya. Um, but areas known as kind of Makassar or the Makassans would actually sail down and travel down carrying, you know, carried by certain currents and, and uh, uh, you know, ocean um, seasonal winds, I believe, to the northern part of Australia and trade and over time build these relationships with the indigenous Australian population in the very north of the country. And there's all kinds of different fascinating stories and evidence from, from this, again, long before European settlement. Um, I was very fortunate to visit and meet a number of the people connected with those stories and paths and um, there's different kind of artifacts and even, you know, rock art you see of Macassan boats that I was able to uh, visit and see and photograph as part of a project, for example, with the uh, Islamic Museum in Australia. So we have an Islamic Museum in, in Melbourne, one of our big cities. Mm -hmm. um, so it's actually, um, there's quite a rich and deep history there. Another part of Australian Muslim history that's also quite fascinating is sometime later, so after really the colony, you know, which uh, grew into a you know small, uh, you know, small Commonwealth nation, if you like, um, uh, over some time, the as the as the sort of you know country was expanding, um, you know, sort of modern day Australia as we think of it, the um, the there were certain geographical challenges that you know if you can think of what you think of when you think of Australia, the kind of nature, particularly the outback part, which is in the central part of the country. Uh, was very difficult for uh, very difficult terrain to explore. So as people were kind trying to you know expand, uh, build you know further and further um, agriculture or you know settlement uh, further and deeper into the country, um, horses don't go well in the desert. Uh, in in you know, but the British um, kind of I guess empire looked at this is a very simplified version, but <laughs> kind of looked at where else in the empire at that time they had. Um, you know, desert dwelling, um, uh, you know, culture. And basically what we think of, of as modern day, um, modern day Afghanistan, and Pakistan, uh, people from what are now known as the Cameliers were basically brought here to Australia and all these camels and the Muslim, uh, if you like, handlers of these camels were brought all throughout uh, parts of Australia and they helped opened up the roads, the telegraph wires, mm. the and eventually the train lines, and they would deliver the mail and the water and supplies. And there's all these fantastic uh, little stories uh, all throughout. This is sort of the pre, before you know, before trains really, um, you know, were all across the country. There's all these stories. So you can go to right to the heart of Australia, in the middle of the most kind of iconic desert, if you like, you know, full outback, and you will find Muhammad Street, Thadadin wow. Street you'll find that the there's a rail, very famous railway that comes right across the desert now 
uh, called the Ran, and the Ran is, you know, directly and the little icon, the brand, or the, you know, if you like, is a is a camelier. So one of these, you know, with a big turban and clearly from this heritage. That and they, the most fascinating part of that to me is that they left a whole series of these very beautiful little tin mosques and little almost kind of like mud brick style mosques. Very very simple that mm. almost you could imagine might have been at the time of the very early days of Medina, for example. Uh, you know, these very simple structures with palm trees and so on. These exist uh, in the middle of a, in the middle of Australia. <laughs> so, you know, still you find know them? I went to one. Find them? Yeah, you still find them. And, you know, fortunately, quite a few have been uh, restored and respected by the locals and preserved, which is quite wonderful, really. Mm. And you can visit even one today from 1862 uh, I went to, and it was quite amazing to think. But many Australians don't really know this part of history and, I guess it's part of, um, you know, part of our role is to to share that if we're aware of it. Great. So, what about the the current situation of Muslims? What's the what's the situation of Muslims right now? Uh, are they based in uh, in big big cities? Uh, what's the percentage of the Muslim population in general? Is it growing? Uh, do you have a lot of masjids? Or do you are you well implemented? Um, implemented? Yes. Yeah. So- yeah, so we so basically from much later after that time, you you have uh, particularly um, you know in the t- sort of twentieth century, you have different waves of migration, particularly the latter part, and you have really this incredible diversity. So within Australia, I think you have a hundred plus Muslim cultures, if you like. So there's actually every kind. Of, it's like a little microcosm of the Ummah sometimes, which is fascinating. And mm-hmm. depending on where you are, um, mostly concentrated in the cities like Sydney and Melbourne. Um, you'll, you know, you'll see uh, these very diverse communities and quite a few of them are, I guess you'd say, uh, particularly, you know, in the previous few decades were, you know, organized, organized around, you know, traditional uh, migration kind of pattern where you'd have certain community. So let's say my local mosque actually is Bosnia. So, you wow. know, a lot of the Bosnian community set up here. But if you mm-hmm. go to a Jummah on a Friday, it's very diverse. You have a lot of um, people from, say, Arab or Lebanese background. There's a lot of Lebanese Australians um, in Sydney in particular. Um, but you'll have Indonesians. You, again, think of the proximity. Um, and you'll have, you know, in this increasing myth, uh, mix, um, one of the mosques that I uh, visited before I, before I was Muslim was a very, very beautiful Ottoman-style Turkish mosque in uh, mm. Sydney, and it looks like a tiny, tiny slice of Ottoman history in the middle of Australia that the Turkish community did an amazing job establishing. And uh, so, it's, basically, what you find is uh, quite a mix, uh, which is which is quite wonderful. I think percentage wise, it's still quite small. It's probably between two and five percent of the global of, of the the you know the national population. Okay. Australia has a population of around thirty million. People, so you can sort of do the math there. That's where yeah. we are. We do definitely have plenty of mosques. We have a lot of Islamic schools. Uh, by and large, because of this, you know, such a diverse group of Muslims, you have, you know, lots of Muslims that are professionals. You have lots of students um, mm-hmm. internationally that, that come. Um, and one thing we have surprisingly is we have, particularly in the cities, a lot of halal food because. Australia actually exports a lot of its meat to yes. Indonesia, the mm-hmm. Gulf region. So it just mm-hmm. so happens, even though you're a small population, you might have a, um, you have, you know, where I live, for example, most of the pretty much things like lamb or chicken is probably going to be halal or, you know, quite a lot of it, even if the people eating there aren't fully aware of it, mm-hmm. or you could look at the certificate if you ask. So uh, mm-hmm. overall, it's quite, quite a, um, you know, uh, depending on who you ask, obviously there's been plenty of issues over the years. That's probably your next question. <laughs> it's like how, uh, you know, what's the experience like? The situation is, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, why don't you go ahead and ask and then I'll, I'll share. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, 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 I mean, I did that. I uh, wasn't about to ask the question, but as you, as you give me the, uh, as you as proposed me to, to ask this question, like what, what's the, is there how how are the the different communities said that there are so many different communities uh, in Australia? Uh, do do they do they work together as one community, or do we can can you see that there are like very specific community working within themselves within their groups? Uh, that's one thing. And the second thing is that do you do you see that the the state of the of Islam in 
in Australia is, get, is getting uh, is growing, it's getting better and better over the years, or is it stagnating, or is it challenging? Yeah, I would say there's there's a quite a few complex parts to that to unpack, and mm -hmm. and you know you could probably do this podcast with a hundred different Australian Muslims and get all sorts of you know di quite mm. different perspectives on things. Um, I have, I guess, an interesting journey through you know being the first you know first twenty years of my life in you know kind of suburban southern Sydney as um, you know just growing up as a teenager here and doing a lot of normal stuff you know for for people like me. Uh, <laughs> And then, uh, but then, you know, and I didn't have a lot of contact with Islam and Muslims during that time. And then really, you know, the 20 years since getting to know so many parts of the Australian Muslim community has been quite, you know, quite wonderful and fantastic. But there's, there's definitely complexity. There are all kinds of different issues. Um, there has, I think, definitely been, you know, strong streets of streaks of racism that a lot of people will report, particularly when you have heightened times of Islamophobia you know, unfortunately, always women get targeted more, you know, visibly Muslim people might have that um, experience more, and especially, you know, uh, difficult times around, uh, I'm sure you're, you're well aware of the, you know, the peak times when that might have been happening with global events and headlines. Um, mm -hmm. But I also see a lot of more promising things if I, I'm more of a optimist glass half full kind of mm -hmm. person where I see uh, a lot of genuine success from younger Muslim professionals, from, you know, businesses that have established and become, you know, well known here, from more Muslims in government, more Muslims in different kind of sectors and places. So just having that presence really, I mm -hmm. think, has helped a lot. And you find a lot of, you find more incidental Muslim, um, you know, characters in, you know, popular culture or TV shows or advertising, all of these things help, uh, you know, but yeah, look, I think we still got a long way to go. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to paint too rosy a picture, but mm -hmm. I'm optimistic. And some of the things that I saw 20 years ago, I think have really improved. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it's um, uh, in my experience, and I think quite a few of my friends, um, you know, who are from quite different cultural backgrounds, some of them are, you know, hijab women, wearing women. Um, I generally have had, um, I think, reports that things are better than they might have been some years ago mm -hmm. great so um let's now talk about your your main expertise design and um and what, what how did design become become so important to you um and how did you um connect that to to, to your faith and how do you th what do you think it's so so linked to faith yeah well big and favorite topic here now. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so I think from a young age, I was interested in different kinds of uh, creative practice and mm -hmm. also quite interested in technology. So early kind of computers and interested in digital art from a young age. Uh, I didn't really know sort of design necessarily as a, as a practice or a discipline or even a profession, what exactly that kind of meant, but I definitely had a love for graphic design. So you know, from early kind of computers and, you know, playing around with things like Photoshop in the early 90s or mid 90s, I really felt, wow, this is very exciting. You know, it's a place where, uh, and this is the early internet era, you know, long before social media, but definitely where you're able to, um, you know, create art, you're able to, you know, combine, um, you know, visual communication using digital tools. And it was a pretty exciting era to, you know, be a young person in. And um, I, I kind of, I guess was so enthusiastic about that, but you know, that people around me could see that and ended up, you know, kind of doing very basic projects and eventually freelancing where people was like, Hey, can you help me with this? Can you design that? That kind of grew into like, Hey, I need a website. Do you know how to do that? You know, do I need uh, you know, tell me about, um, you know, branding or designing identity or designing some kind of poster. So back at that time, you know, in my late teens, I started actually freelancing and, and earning, you know, pretty, pretty reasonable income. Uh, I also worked at McDonald's for a short time and quickly realized that uh, I think I can do much better uh, with my graphic design career than, than uh, working here. But it gave me an appreciation for, for lots of things and, and entrepreneurship, you know, over time. So initially it was a, really a love and of the potential for visual communication. And over time that really grew into needing to understand what the clients need, what the, what the project needs rather than just, you know, how do, how do we make look something, something look great or look visually appealing or effective? 
but you know what do you know what's actually going to be um, helpful for a client project to you know change mm. a condition or communicate something and then as i got further into that it was really trying to understand a strategy and what do uh how to you know how do people react to things what are uh how do you start optimizing and researching so that what you are designing actually solves a problem and solves it well and eventually delightfully or what what are the things that uh you know the world needs that um you know a customer might be um you know where you can kind of meet at the intersection mm -hmm. of people products and and design strategy so i felt more and more in that place i was able to grow my practice from just one person to you know eventually you know 20 people um in different countries and uh doing lots of kind of great projects where i think um my faith came in played an increasingly important role so i'd started freelancing a little bit you know from that young age but after i became muslim i was very curious about what is the kind of muslim understanding of design what is the creative legacy or even you know very clear there's this stunning visual heritage everyone even if you're not really into design you you're probably aware of you know beautiful islamic calligraphy or places like the alhambra or the blue mosque you're aware of uh something special about these places they're super popular even as tourist destinations so uh i went on a bit of a quest to basically every time every you know every time i could do enough projects to save up and you know fund a, a trip i would fly myself back to somewhere like syria or turkey uh or jordan or morocco where i'd studied arabic for a while and was in this you know state for some years of exploration research asking and what i immediately started to realize that the the type of graphic design and type of product design i'd been taught was really very commercial very business driven very enterprising it's really about selling things and in many cases digital products to grab attention but what i love so much about you know these islamic uh you know islamic design kind of um approach in islamic art was it was really designed for uh remembrance it was designed for inviting you to contemplate and to think of the divine and to mm. be in a space of presence and and appreciate beauty in an ex experiential way not so just when, to when you talk distract. about design when you talk about design sorry now it's a more i mean you talk mostly about the architecture of of the buildings and masjids in those countries right That's right, but also just it could be um certain objects. So it could be the mm -hmm. way that you know certain surface is tiled, or the, the way that calligraphy. You know, if you go to uh, you know places in you know uh, different parts of the Islamic world, even I went to China for example and got to see you know mosques in in Beijing where they had a very different calligraphy style. So Khatsini, you know, the Chinese style, but mm -hmm. very um you know very Chinese, but also very Islamic in its message and. And I appreciated there was a phrase from one of my teachers, quoting a scholar, who says that Islam is like this clear, clear uh, water that flows around the planet, and wherever it flows, it reflects the colors of the bedrock under which it uh, is seen. So that's why in in China, for example, you know, Islam looks Chinese. Uh, mm -hmm. If you go to to Turkey, of course, in Istanbul, you see that very distinct style, and so on. Um, so as I started to travel more and more, I, I was interviewing more scholars and creative professionals and meeting people on this path of uh, curiosity about what is Islamic design and what does that mean today? So we may not be able to, you know, sit for 20 hours and prepare our calligraphy, read and sit and, you know, kind of meditate with, you know, preparing, you know, like the way people might have in the past. But what are some principles and aspirations we can have as contemporary designers, professionals, and later entrepreneurship? As I started to get further into the path of you know design, innovation, and working with startups, uh, is trying to see what what from these traditional understandings we can apply today. Mm -hmm. What what do you think is the what what do you think the, the Islamic design is? What's the value added of Islamic design? What can it bring? What of positive uh why do you think it's so important well to me it's islamic design is all about design for remembrance bringing mm -hmm. to that place of seek seeking god and bringing you not about the individual artists who might have worked on that but to bring you to a place of contemplation and ultimately mm -hmm. to a place of of surrender and peace and and understanding 
uh, beautiful and I think, you know, even s simple Islamic art does that. It, it's very, uh, you know, it can be transformative in, mm -hmm. uh, in you know, and in, in, in affect someone's spiritual state, you know, just by these, these secrets of tr understanding these traditional design. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think in, but how do you, the question becomes, how do you apply that today? When you're busy, you've got deadlines, you've got deliverables, you know, you might have work in a place where you're like, we need to get, you know, these marketing deadlines, uh, you know, done. We need to reach, you know, social media content every, yeah. you know, every 30 seconds, we need more, more, more. So it's challenging. Um, but I think there are certain uh, understandings that, uh, you know, I, I feel like I've arrived at, you know, from these years of exploring and learning that we should aspire to. And so, of course, looking even at our intentionality, you know, understanding ANIA, uh, that's not always done, even in, you know, popular design practice. It's not always looked at more deeply, understanding mm -hmm. your, you know, there's a big role that design has in terms of the responsibility, you know, in terms of you're dealing with not just a person, but that person has a, a spiritual state. And at the deepest level, it's, you know, especially as a designer or a creative person, it's trying to be aware that, you know, we're not humans having a spiritual experience we're spiritual beings having a human experience and that changes your design perspective it elevates your questions and you feel the amana the trust of if i'm in a position to influence how a product is made or how some kind of uh, creative experience is designed uh it, you know you've got to be careful you've got to be responsible with what you're doing yes uh do it. In terms of uh, design, we see like in some, I'm going to come, come back to the Western parts uh, a bit later, but um, from what you, you you have seen and what I have seen during our travels, you have nowadays uh, beautiful historical um, messages or buildings, architectures. Uh, and even nowadays in many Arab countries or in African countries, many message, beautiful, very beautiful messages are built. But... Uh, uh, do, do you think that, I, I feel that sometimes the spirit of what it's supposed to be is a bit lost because when you go to this message, it is very empty, it seems very dry, um, but it still has beautiful design. So how do you, how do you reconcil reconciliate uh, those two elements? Yeah, I think it, it takes a lot more than even the most beautiful design spaces. You know, there's, there's a lot more that, um, is required in this in this age, um, and I think for, for all ages, of course, to you know to uh, you know to to get to that that place. And uh, I think it's important that the spaces are beautiful and and take their cultural context into account. But mm -hmm. you know, it's it's a much bigger question, really, about um, the, the the individuals and their own journey and their own seeking. I mean, one way I like to think about this again through a little through the the lens of design perspective is um, thinking about what we might be doing as an interface or a window to invite people to get back to seeking God or you know exploring a spiritual path or taking that more seriously. And what I mean by that is if we think of we're in a world of right now, you know, and I have three three uh, you know kids. Um, two teenagers and it's quite fascinating the journey that they're in a world of digital content digital experiences they're in a world where uh the most influential things that if you let them or people you know in the age bracket it'll be you know four second tiktoks or it'll be like you know doom scrolling reel after reel or it'll be um you know uh, video games that will just go forever you know uh, and mm. you know net Netflix, um, you know, play next episode. And, uh, and, and I'm rather than me pushing back against all of those things saying, avoid them, avoid them. I, that's not my approach. I say that be aware of them, be aware that the design intent of those things is, is usually addiction. A lot of, a lot of the, especially, you know, digital apps, they're designed for addiction. Uh, they're designed for attention. And what we can do is still embrace the digital tools and platforms but and video games for example or great online content great um uh, beautiful social media that's meaningful with good intent uh great media uh, and you know, animated series you know film series I, I believe we should be investing heavily into making those but in a more wholesome way and designing again for remembrance rather than just distraction 
Uh, mm -hmm. That is where, and then maybe you'll see more people in those beautiful mosques, <laughs> inshallah, you know, yeah. but uh, I do, I, I'm also aware that I think there is a, sometimes, um, it's probably a crude analogy, but sometimes I say, and I see that even here in Australia as well, for example, there's an overinvestment into what you might call the hardware, but not the software, meaning you might have an amazing uh, space, facility, you know, it's incredible, you know, mosque, but yeah, go go there at Maghreb and there'll be like 12 people there, <laughs> right? Yeah. Maybe not. I mean, you know, mm. but um, the software is, you know, the people, the inspiration, the the programming, the culturally relevant programming uh, that meets people where they are, that is inclusive, that is designed to understand the cultural context of the day, the language of the day. Uh, and, and that's where I think um, there's enormous responsibility for people that, you know, are in roles of influence, can maybe consider de designing creative content, designing, it could be, you know, a, a book, you know, beautiful books or comics, digital content, games. I mean, there's, there's a lot we can do there. And that's, I think, been a big part of my last 20 years is exploring how we can do that and, and what can we design that uh -huh. may, uh, you know, shift the conversation to, to the, the direction that I think the world needs. Yes. Um, I have two questions. I'm thinking about which one I should ask first. All right, let, let, let's go back to the to the design, Islamic Islamic design in Western countries. Uh, that's I guess that's the countries that are lacking a lot of uh, appropriation of their own design, right? Uh, uh, you shared when we last met uh, a couple of months ago, Uh, you shared to me this uh, this very nice article called uh, Islam and the Cultural Imperative. I, I forgot mm. the name of the author. Maybe you remember. Um, yes, uh, Dr. Omar Farouk Abdallah is, is the author. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I had a look into it, and it 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 looks it look it, it it was really striking. I think I thought it was so obvious. Uh, uh, you already mentioned that earlier, but when you go to China, the, the mosques look Chinese. When you go to to countries in Africa, uh, in Algeria, in Morocco, uh, the most looks uh, Mar Moroccan and and so and so on in various countries. But when you go to to Europe, or when you go to North North America, and presumably also in Australia, uh, what you would find is uh, either uh, very simple, uh, almost no design, like very like like a building, or you would find like imported design from. Uh, those Arab countries or Eastern countries. Um, can, can you come back a little bit, uh, maybe summarize this 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 concept, this article quickly, and tell us why it's how why it's important for for us uh, in Western countries to really um, embrace our Muslim identity and build, I mean, create build uh, our our Muslim uh, identity and design in those places. Yeah, look, I think um, I'll, I'll share a little story and then I'll come back mm -hmm. to that. So, you know, after I became Muslim in Australia, um, you know, I was feeling uh, inwardly, you know, quite at peace at the, at the, you know, at a foundational level, you know, really feeling this mm -hmm. incredible, um, you know, what you might call Sakina that you've, you know, you feel like, you know, a veil has been lifted. You've unlocked this uh you know, this deep, simple, simple truth that, you know, having this, this sense of tawakkal and, you know, reliance on, on God as a profound, uh, you know, mindset that, you know, guides your daily affairs is, is just so reassuring and, and beautiful if, you know, if you're, if you're able to be in that place of remembrance. But outwardly, you know, in terms of my kind of cultural journey, if you like, or my identity, you know, I was feeling a bit lost because, you know, there was, uh, there were different kind of Muslim groups. I would go to the Bosnian mosque or I'd go to, you know, what are probably more Lebanese or, you know, Arab mosques, if you like. At that time, it was felt a little bit more siloed. And this is not unusual, as we know, in, in a lot of probably European or North American context. Um, And I was struggling a little bit to go, what is kind of the Australian Muslim identity? What is it? What isn't it? I'm not sure. At that time, I ended up, for different reasons, uh, moving to California for a little while, and San Francisco in particular. And what I found there was Islam, at least the kind of circles that I was connected to, was quite a bit more established in terms of 
you know, what you might call homegrown English speaking scholars, people that had um, learned from teachers that were, you know, Californian who had, you know, embraced Islam at some point, studied the tradition, you know, deeply and in mm -hmm. many cases in centers of learning like uh, maybe Mauritania or, or Syria or, you know, Yemen, Tarim. And, but the students around those people and the influence they had was bringing this, the, this, uh, this truth and this spiritual wisdom and the teachings that, you know, are authentic and deeply connected through, you know, through the, you know, the scholars and the Sanad, um, but in a context that was very Western. And so I had this mm. moment, for example, where I remember early, I was uh, not too long after I landed in uh, California, you know, someone that I kind of got to know briefly said, hey, why don't you come, come over to my place this evening? I have a few friends around. I'm like, yeah, great, great. And at one point he turns all the lights off and goes, okay, guys, all right, just hang on. I was like, he goes, get ready. I'm like, what is happening? What's, what's going to happen here? And all of a sudden the guy, you know, turns on his collectible Star Wars lightsaber collection. <laughs> and suddenly the room lights up with these cool, super, you know, bright colored uh, lightsabers. And I, am you know, I, my geek background loves Star Wars. Right. And I'm like, oh, wow. So this guy is like very Muslim, very knowledgeable, you know, he's, you know, he's, he knows Arabic well, he's learned it, but he also loves Star Wars. <laughs> and I, I suddenly have this little simple moment of like, oh, that's, there is nothing wrong with uh, being both of those things. And uh, as I spent more time in that, in California, for example, I was like, there's more and more things that I felt just because of the way, uh, you know, I grew up, the kind of influence I had, the kind of from, whether it's from fashion to, you know, even music parts of it, you know, more conscious hip hop, for example, things that I connected with, I felt culturally then at ease. So coming back to Australia and I saw more and more of this change. Where I was going with all of that and just that simple story is, uh, the, I think the article addresses the, the importance and, and, and relevance of uh, not just divorcing your, your, uh, your faith from, you know, it's, it's context of who you are, your identity and, the the things that have made up your path and uh, your tradition and and as long as those things are not uh, really you know having negative effects or pulling you away from those fundamentals in Islam then it can be such a a, a beautiful enriching thing you have that diversity I mean one of the coolest things about being Muslim is you can go to pretty much anywhere in the world almost any country any pocket of the world if you find a place of worship you find a mosque um, you know, you will have this rapport immediately. You'll have this set of rituals and understandings. Uh, you can pray together. You will probably know a bunch of surahs together. You, you know, there's this beautiful, and if, you know, Muslims, I think sometimes don't appreciate that, you know, that beautiful, um, you, you might call um, unity, but not uniformity, right? That we have this unity, even though it doesn't always might, you know, might not look like that, you know, and not really politically perhaps, but unity in the, those basic tenets of faith, very powerful and very empowering and enriching. But that diversity that we have, like when I visited that, that mosque in Beijing, being able to have that, that beautiful understanding immediately, even if there's language barriers. So the article goes into that, but in much more technical detail as well, in terms of uh, understanding the fiqh and understanding the scholarly uh, approach to this. So I can give you the fun examples with Star Wars, uh, what Dr. Omar there is doing is giving you, uh, you know, the much, I think, more uh, scholarly understanding of why this is important. And I'd encourage anyone to read it. I think it's been out for some years, like perhaps even, I don't know, maybe even 20 years or, you know, at least 15 years, but it's quoted time and again by many people uh, that I respect. Mm -hmm. um, my next question is, um... So we talked about the the the, the, the imperative of uh, of um, creating our own Muslim identity in Western countries. Is that something that you are aiming aiming to in your work? Like, is that for you like a north star, uh, something that you're trying to grow? Or what what's your own vision uh, with design? Yeah, I come back to this idea that I think we have a an opportunity, and I think of it as an amana, really, like a trust that if we've been given these great opportunities in tools and technologies and platforms and even just, you know, good Wi-Fi that works and good coffee that keeps us, you know, kind of, you know, uh, warm, <laughs> then, you know, this is 
already more than so many people on the planet that are, you know, are not gifted those things that have other, Mm -hmm. other kinds of blessings. But we have, you know, particularly in Western countries, uh, in Australia, US, UK, um, you know, we have incredible platforms and opportunities and I I think a big amana to help in different ways. And of course, you know, many traditional ways are things like through charitable activities, through uh, all kinds of things that I think Muslims are, are really active in doing, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, you know, for example, supporting the difficult refugee situations around the world, um, all kinds of, you know, through things like uh, zakat and you know, eid uh, activities. But I think what what we have is a much bigger opportunity and a responsibility to design using the language and tools of the day, which for me is digital content and digital products and interfaces. And, you know, that may include things like VR and AR or embracing AI, you know, with, with, um, with real concern and guidelines and guardrails, especially something like AI, rather than turning away from technology, just at a fundamental level, I think it is being curious about those things, um, having, being in the conversation, designing experiments and getting feedback from scholars and, you know, knowledgeable people about things we're building that to me extends to things like products and brands and, and using like consumer understanding of kind of like consumer goods, but trying to do that in a responsible and holistic way, Look, not looking at success of just how much can I sell, how much money I can make. That is the paradigm we need to break. It's like how meaningful and how much impact can I have on either suppliers I'm working with or the team that I'm hiring, um, trying to bring these, values of Nia and working with towards Ahsan in what we do, not just the product, but in the team and the culture, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, working with sincerity and ikhlas. I think uh, that's what I would love to try to be a part of is bringing back what this traditional understanding was. It's not just, you know, rushing more junk out and selling something with Islam on the label and saying, yeah, it's Islamic. No, but really looking at, well, what, what traditionally made something more, you know, inspired by Islam? What can we apply from that into the to the modern world? And that's not to say we're always going to get it right, um, but I don't think we should just sit back and watch our young people just be completely addicted to, you know, consumer lifestyles and fast fashion and you know, highly addictive and sometimes dangerous apps. We need to be in the conversation, and I think we need to create not just alternatives, you know, I think that's not, you know, always the right word, but, um, you know, create sometimes the leading, the leading products and services that, um, the, you know, universally people can benefit from and appreciate. <clears throat> it doesn't even have to necessarily be packaged in something that says Islam or for Muslims at all. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, I think sometimes some of the best products and ideas will, will take those values and bring them to life and universal will be uh, beneficial. That's what, that's, that's my most, that's my long and complex North star, if you like. <laughs> mm, mm. That's interesting. Um, don't, don't you think that something that comes to my mind, I'm just asking, like, because the technology is evolving so fast and faster and faster, actually, uh, don't you think that it might be sometimes uh, uh, misleading, you know, in a, in a sense that, uh, you have to jump, you have to o- o- always be in the forefront. So you have to jump from one technology to another each time. Is that, is that something that you think we're supposed to be in each time in the forefront or maybe to take a step back and decide where we want to have an implication? Yeah, I, I think the um, I, I think you, you want people that are in those pioneering roles. For example, you know, we hosted uh, and have had a number of sessions about AI and Islam, uh, you know, my studio here and, you know, globally, you know, different groups and networks I'm connected to with some Muslims really at the forefront of researching that. And, you know, but the, but also I'm, the ones I know personally are very sincere and they're concerned and they're not trying to sugarcoat uh, mm-hmm. this potential and danger of like, yeah, AI really having a major detrimental effect on many things we cherish. I think that's, it's a very real concern at the same time, you know, there's people I trust in those roles that are connected to, to scholarship and are deeply, you know, rooted in their own kind of faith and, and uh, have a solid Islamic grounding, you know. Uh, so so I'm, I take reassurance when there are people like that 
um, in terms of mass adoption, well, this is the thing is like we can sit here and have a you know great podcast conversation about it, but if some thirteen year old has their homework assignment due or their Islamic studies essay due, and Chat GPT can write it for them, well, a lot of kids might just be like, you know what, go write it for me, right? <laughs> They're not going to ask permission necessarily. Mm-hmm. I mean. I'd like to think that's not the case, but I, I just know that it's a real danger to the whole education system right now. And including all kinds of Islamic uh, education is just going to be, our hand is a little bit forced is what I see, is what I kind of see that we have to be in the conversation, but it's, it, it, uh, you know, I don't want us to think like technology is, has all these answers all the answers are in our tradition, all the, you know, we're still just as human as ever. We have the same Mm -hmm. um, challenges. We have the same kind of needs. We have the same kind of nafs as in the books. All these things are there for us to learn. And we want to be on that path of improvement, growth, you know, purification in our spiritual life uh, and be wary of technology. But I just, I still feel like we, you know, uh, my personal position is we're just as Muslim communities a little too conservative and a too li- too um, you know too much on the receiving end. And before we know it, you know, like a classic example of uh, gosh, how many parents I know are like, man, my you know kids I know they just want to play Fortnite. They, you know, they just want to sit and watch this mm-hmm. show. I'm like, yeah, but you know what? Like for the last five, 10 years, who has been making the games and making the shows and putting the millions into Netflix, you know, and then occasionally you'll have a breakout success like Urtugal, right, which became globally popular, uh, you know, that's like one of the few examples where, you know, media has been done in, in that kind of more more wholesome way. If we just had another hundred of those and, you know, a hundred great video games, I think, you know, that stuff's really important. But we need to change our mindset, support those kind of projects, uh, encourage people to, you know, be into design, spiritually grounded, but create these kind of experiences. That's what's mm-hmm. been really lacking uh, that kind of, um, you know, enthousi- enthusiasm to uh, all these curiosity to support mm-hmm. things that are well intentioned, well designed. Would you mind sharing a few examples of uh, well designed uh, tools or? Um, examples of uh, object or anything that supports the, the the Muslim community and anyone else, which is uh, designed as you as you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. So the phrase I use a lot is what I call heart centered design. So isn't necessarily just purely kind of Islamic design. Isn't necessarily just for Muslims. Uh, it's for people. Sometimes it's by Muslims for everyone, which is I think mm-hmm. a great great approach as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, for example, um, where we met uh, Abdurrahman in Bali was partly created from a platform called LaunchGood. I think LaunchGood are a really good example. If you haven't come across them, launchgood.com basically are a Islamic, uh, or a, a, you'd call a crowdfunding site for Muslim projects. And it's had a tremendous success. Uh, they've raised, I think, nearly 400 million US dollars uh, since they started. And uh, it's a great um, platform for doing good, supporting good uh, mm-hmm. entrepreneurially. There's charity, community projects, and you know have a great design team. You know the the product. If you go on their app, for example, it has a good UX. It really encourages people to to do good and donate more. You know they might have a simple thing like join Friday Givers. So I've been a since the beta project project uh, of Friday Givers. I, I don't even care, remember what the amount is, but every week automatically, you know, I have an amount that's donated every Friday to a great cause that they pick, you know, that's that's the cause of the week. That's a, such a simple little thing, but I know for the last, gosh, probably at least five years, every Friday, a small donation is made automatically. And uh, that's a great design experience. And, uh, you know, I think there should be a lot more examples like that. There, there's a few, but that's one of my favorites. Okay. Um, I remember uh, one of the examples that we gave, and I think that's the one that worked a lot in in France. Was it uh, the brand was Z- Zilich or something like that? The um, yeah, we had, so we yeah we made um we made uh, a brand called Five Pillars. Uh, in fr- I remember how we spell it in French, but it's basically uh we did it in a few different languages, and it became it was, I remember it being quite popular. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it sold really well in France. And uh, in COVID, we had to pause production and a few things changed because of the, you know, global shipping. But I, um, uh, it's, that's one of my favorite, it's a simple example. You know, it's just a board, it's a board game, but it's, you know, it's, it's well designed, it's visually appealing. And a board game is nice because it's a great way for a family or community to come together. Uh, it, you don't need any apps, devices, any Wi-Fi. You can just sit down face-to-face, play a board game. But it's all around Islamic trivia uh, and Islamic content. And there's different levels, different versions. We made junior edition for kids. We made complex, you know, editions, a Sierra edition. You know, it's travel. There's a fun box where there's this different kind of fun activities like charade style or, you know, Pictionary where you have to draw. Uh, and it's, you know, a fun way to learn. It's just a good way of, um, I think, using, uh, you know, potential of design, understanding the problem. So the root problem there isn't just like, hey, we need it. We need another game. The root problem is like parents and people are looking for, uh, they, they, they realize the importance of Islamic knowledge and having that traditional spiritual wisdom, you know, in, in our lives. Uh, but lectures aren't necessarily working. You know, Madrasa Islamic school isn't necessarily working. Um, you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But, but if kids are enjoying this board game and they want to play it more and more, which is what I'd seen, then uh, that's solving the same problem, which is education or, you know, teaching kind of Islamic concepts, but in a much more um, fun way. And it, it's not really wouldn't replace traditional learning, but definitely it complements that. It's using mm-hmm. design-led thinking to... Uh, support that same objective and so i'd like to think more and more we should be designing again the same problems the same issues we're trying to solve but let's there's lots of creative ways to do that great um we are reaching the end of the the interview peter uh i still have a few uh, smaller questions to ask but before that do you have anything to add something that maybe you would you wish that you we mentioned or we might have forgot to mention Look, I think my problem is I can talk too much. I had a nice coffee just before we started and uh, the caffeine is, is still, uh, you know, there. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, why don't, you, why don't you go ahead and ask and, uh, you know, yeah. I'd love Great. to explore. Great. So what's the most important skill or the few most important skills that, that you use in your day-to-day activity? I think for myself, but anyone listening, hopefully, is let's develop what I might call a designer mindset or even an entrepreneurial mindset. It doesn't mean you have to be a designer or a professional designer or a startup founder or someone, you know, who's going to drop everything and and start a business, but bring a curiosity and a a, a creative uh, approach to the problems and frustrations you have. And, and, and they might be lots of things. They might be things in your immediate life or, you know, your, you know, your career, community problems, umma problems, planetary problems. There's plenty of, there's no shortage. I would say find the, the ones that, or one even, that, you know, you feel so compelled to you need to work on this. This is something you can do. And bring your creative designer mindset, which is reframes that from a problem to a challenge. Where it's like, oh, man. You know, my local mosque, uh, they have a problem with, um, I don't know, let's say uh, they use always uh, plastic everywhere, plastic cups, you know, so many plastic waste, you know, whatever. That's a problem. The designer, if you reframe that as a design challenge, you say, well, how might we reduce plastic in my local mosque? How might we, you know, how might we make it fun to recycle at the mosque? Right. And maybe there's so many simple things you can do. Maybe there's a little challenge for people, you know, uh, maybe someone sponsors. The thing. There's so many creative ways you can do that. Um, and our entrepreneurial mindset is looking at how we can use innovation and commercial perspective to solve problems as well. And I think it's a great tool for change that we would do well as an Ummah to, to embrace more as our, you know, earliest examples in, in the Sahaba uh, did with uh, merchant uh, merchant uh, mercantile activity is that um, it's at the heart of our tradition and I think we shouldn't shy away from embracing that that seeing success in a holistic and wholesome way success is not just how much did you earn but uh, what kind of change you were able to affect what kind of lives you were able to help transform or if even if not that just you know living in a sustainable halal income 
uh, in a world with a lot of difficult, uh, you know, influences, um, that's a, it's a very beautiful thing. Fantastic. Um, I think your, your day-to-day life is might be very, uh, very, very, very busy. So how, how do you, what are your, your, your routines? How do you rejuvenate yourself? How, what are your, your daily or weekly routines to, you know, to keep, uh, to keep uh, high energy and to progress? Yeah, look, it's a great, great question. And, and I don't want to pretend I'm some superhuman that, you know, is, uh, you know, uh, just having this um, incredible, you know, high performance lifestyle all the time. You know, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, I, I try where I can to put my family first in terms of, um, you know, being there every morning for my kids, you doing, you know, things like school drop or helping with breakfast and uh, in evenings, you know, being being present. Uh and uh you know as they get older like just knowing that 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 is um you know the value of of that in an age of digital distraction uh that human kind of connection is still you know increasingly just so important to just to kind of be there and and have these um you know that presence like on the weekend i was you know playing playing some board games with my son for example and the default in this age is still digital entertainment digital everything so it's nice to do that uh I think, though, I'm very fortunate that uh, I have a great team. I've developed a great team. Um, I have good partners I work with that give me energy. Uh, very fortunate. I have a nice studio space that's close to the beach here in Sydney. One of the reasons I love, you know, living in Sydney is that, you know, it's for a lot of the cities are very coastal. Um, but also, I really try to get um, create a community events and have different kind of meetups, for example, where I invite different entrepreneurs different creatives or different kind of leaders to come to my studio, give small talks to, you know, groups of people that are interested in whatever that topic is. For example, uh, next week we have one with a founder here in Australia who, um, you know, raised, you know, one of the largest investment rounds in Australia has a super successful unicorn company, but it's so humble and so chill. And so many people don't just seem as a guy from the mosque, they don't actually realize. (laughs) So, uh, uh, I get energy from those kind of things. I appreciate not everyone does, but it's just, I guess my personality is, is you know, keeping that momentum. But also mm-hmm. just feeling aligned. You know, you want your spiritual aspirations to be aligned with your work. Um, so you don't feel like, I know that's a simple thing to say, hard thing to do. And not every work day is this, you know, it's not like some sort of angelic uh, experience where you just always fully, you know, feel like every moment is, uh, fully aligned, but I think coming back to those basics and looking at our, really looking at our work and saying, is this aligned with what I want to be doing? Or, you know, if right now it's difficult, am I taking steps to get closer? Uh, and inshallah, you know, like keep making that intention and keep finding ways to get closer to that alignment where you are feeling aligned, where you your work and your daily um, activity aligns with your purpose, the people around you, the culture you're in, is uh you know uh, supporting your spiritual aspirations rather than pulling you away and if not you know what are some changes there and that's the heart of the the program that i teach called the heart of design um which is exploring design as a spiritual practice that's alhamdulillah what i'm able to teach and you know help people through that process i'll add that in the in the comment in the description section i'm very fortunate to to be able to follow your, your class actually I uh, still have to catch up uh, the last session, I think, uh, due to the time zone difference. I think it's at 2 a.m. here in France, but is, uh, I really appreciate your, your class and, and thank you for that. Um, do you have, um, what are you, do, do you have any recommendation of books, let's say, uh, of the top, uh, let's say two or three books uh, that you have either recently read or that have uh, been, in, been a great inspiration for you? Yeah, look, uh, there, there's many. Um, and you also find through the seasons of life, you know, the, you have this kind of uh, what is the right fit for your book? You know, you're the right book for that season of life. So something that I found 20 years ago, maybe like transformative would be maybe different today, you know, so it really depends on where you're at. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, so I get that. Um, one of them that I've gone back to consistently is called Living Presence by Mm -hmm. Kabir Helminski. Living Presence, I think, is a really wonderful book in English uh, that um, explores, I think, uh, it has this wonderful kind of, uh, I'd call spiritual vocabulary that 
uh, I haven't found in too many other uh, Islamic books um, that just really describes, uh, so it's about 25 years old and it's, it's been reissued. It's been consistently popular. So that's a beautiful one, uh, Living Presence. Uh, there's a classic called uh, The War of Art, not The Art of War. It's The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. That's an amazing book about overcoming resistance and sort of getting things done. Uh, basically the nuffs, <laughs> you know, look at the creative blocks that, uh, you know, you, you might do to come o- overcome nuffs. That's a great one. And then maybe a third one called The Artist's Way in a similar way. The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron is a really good one that uh, helps kind of rejuvenate a sense of creativity and purpose that often gets lost in, in a lot of adults as they get busy in their professional lives. They kind of forget that when they're younger, there are so many the creative pursuits that they were able to do. It helps people kind of recover that path. And, uh, and that might be things just like, you know, try journaling a little bit, going for nature walks, taking artist tastes. So The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron is a great one as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, um, Peter. Uh, last question, maybe, if uh, someone from the audience, anyone from the audience uh, wants to follow your work, and maybe if they have a, a question and they want to reach out to you, is that possible? Yeah, of course. I'd be very happy to. Um, so you can just Google Google my name, Peter Gould. There's two Peter Goulds. Well, there's actually many, but the, the two that will come up One of them is a Hollywood uh, director who's very famous and has done a whole bunch of, you know, popular shows. So I'm the other one that will come up. <laughs> so I'm the Australian Muslim, design, Australian Muslim designer that will come up. Um, probably on Instagram, I try and post, um, you know, a little bit what's happening. I have a newsletter where I share different activities uh, and LinkedIn as well. I've, you know, try to have different uh, conversations on LinkedIn. So any of those are good or, you know, contact me through the site. And uh, I hope to, out of, hope to be able to visit you there um, in France sometime, inshallah. Of course, let me know if you, if you have the opportunity to come. I would be happy to, to host you, inshallah. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Peter. I really appreciated uh, talking with you as usual. Uh, I, hope to see, I hope to see you again, maybe in the next uh, uh, GMW event. Who knows? <laughs> um, inshallah. Yeah. I, I, I really ask, uh, I ask Allah that he adds uh, more baraka in your work even more Baraka in your work and what you do in any of your projects and in your family and, and uh, in your studio, inshallah. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. Inshallah. And for you and all of your listeners, inshallah. I mean, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah.